Romans chapter 5. Verses 1 and 2. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So the interesting thing about a servant-master relationship is that the master is wanting the servant to do well. That's not the case in, 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 in a lot of cases today. In a lot of cases today, in an employer-employee relationship, for example, sometimes there's an employer who would rather see the employee fail. Sometimes there's a parent who would rather see the child fail. But with the servant-master relationship, with the true one, then it, then it only benefits the master if the servant succeeds. And so to withhold instruction or to make the way unclear or to make the task that's needed to be done unclear to the servant does no good to the master. It hurts his efforts. So it's in the best interest of the master that the servant knows his duties to avoid wasting time, to make, to make sure that as much work as possible gets done during the daytime. To get work out of a lazy servant would need a cattle prod or an electric shock but to get work out of a servant that's honest and upright, all it takes is a little instruction. And that's what we get, and that's what we see here, is God giving us instruction. And so, and packaged in with this instruction, he gives us benefits. And so the first benefit that we looked at a couple weeks ago was peace with God. Being justified by Christ, we have peace with God. A servant cannot operate well with the feeling of discomfort with the master. And so, he gives us peace with him and so that we can operate comfortably with him. A person's first day on the job is, the first week maybe, is their most nervous time in the position because they don't know really what's expected. They're getting to know the master, but God gives us peace right at the, right at the outset so that we could get into the way and un understand his expectations. God sends the spirit of justification, or in justification, God sends the spirit of adoption by which we say, Abba, Father. That's the first benefit, peace with God. And the second benefit is what we're going to be talking about today. The second benefit of being justified by faith in Christ is because of, because of being justified by faith in Christ. Verse 2, we have access into the grace of God and by which we stand. The word in there could be translated in or by. It's the word en is uh, the way you transliterate it. It's can be translated in, on, among, by, with, or at. And so by seems to be the better, the better interpretation here, the better translation. So access, what is access? That's the act of bringing, bringing something, of bringing into something. Ephesians 2 or 3.12, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. In whom, in whom, in God, we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in Christ. We have access to what? Access into the grace of God. So what's, what is grace? This is a word that we hear so much about. If you've been around Christianity for even a little while, you've heard a lot about grace. And some of it makes sense and some of it's kind of out there. Maybe it's hard to really understand it. It's hard to figure out what it really means. God's favor, something like that, but it's supposed to help you, but it also gives allowance to be, be human and not, and not be perfect, something like that. So we understand the, the application of grace needed for the new birth, the spiritual birth, but few today understand this, and so we're going we're gonna to take a look at the scriptures to understand it better because the best way to define grace is to let the Bible define it. So we're going to look at a few scriptures just because I, I, I want you to see these. Titus 2. Would you turn there, please? <clears throat> Titus 2. And we're going to be in 11 and 12. Titus 2, verses 11 and 12. We're going to be coming back to Romans here, too. So, so Titus 2. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, 
we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so the grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts and to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. And I want you to notice in this verse also, this is the grace of God that brings salvation. This is the true grace. <clears throat> There's false graces out there, but this is the true kind. It teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And then, and so grace is the calling and empowerment to holiness. The calling and empowerment to holiness. It teaches us and it strengthens us to, to live that way. Then back over to Romans 5. We're going to see verse 21. Romans 5, 21. Romans 5, 21. Here we see grace is the enablement to righteous living. Romans 5, 21. <clears throat> so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And notice there the middle part, through righteousness. It's not that grace reigns to eternal life. No, there's a, there's a middle step. And the middle step is you living in righteousness. And only if that happens is there eternal life. That's echoed in the previous verse, the, the grace of God that brings salvation. The grace of God here might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You, you can't live the righteous life outside of him, but through Jesus Christ our Lord, you sure can. So the grace might reign through righteous living through Jesus Christ our Lord unto eternal life. That, you can't leave out that middle step. You get yourself into quick danger if you leave out the middle step. 1 Corinthians 15.10 is the next one. 1 and here we see a similar thing. So we, the first one we saw, it's an empowerment to holiness. It's a calling and empowerment to holiness. It's an enablement to righteous living, which is pretty much saying the same thing as empowerment to holiness. And here we have again divine empowerment, 1 Corinthians 15.10. <clears throat> but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, the other apostles. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. So this was, this grace enabled Paul to live according to God's commands, to, to, which was for him to preach the gospel. I labored more abundantly than they all. His grace toward me was not in vain, but it was put to good use in that I labored more abundantly than they all. It was the ability of God in me. God's grace is God's ability in me that caused me, enabled me to labor. And 2 Corinthians 12, 9. <clears throat> and so we have a calling and empowerment to holiness, the enablement to righteous or holy living, the d divine empowerment. And next, this one, we've got God's strength working in a believer. These all sound pretty similar, don't they? God's power working in you. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. And he said to me, this, so this is Paul's, he, he pleaded with the Lord three times that, that, the, that the thorn in the flesh would depart from him. And, and the Lord said to him, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Grace is God's strength. God's grace for you is God's strength made perfect in you. His grace is his strength. God's strength working in the believer. And then another one, 2 Timothy 2, verse 1. Second Timothy 2 Timothy 2.1, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Do you see what grace does? It makes you strong. Be strong by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. That's the same word, Ian, in on among by with that. By, be strong by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And then the last one, Ephesians 3.7. So grace makes you strong in the faith. 
Strong for what? Strong for living a holy life, living righteously, divine empowerment to do God's work. And this one's Ephesians 3, 7. This is God's ability to perform spiritual tasks. Ephesians 3, 7. Of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. So this is so grace is the effective working of God's power given to Paul or to you or to me. It's God's power working effectively in you. It works. So back over to Romans 5. <clears throat> And this divine power working through us, this enablement to righteous living, this strength of God that works in the believer, this God-given ability to perform spiritual tasks, this empowerment to holiness, all of these things describe the use of grace in the believer's life. What is grace for? Is, is, is grace just for God to look over your sins, to make you feel like you're in favor with him? Is, 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 can grace, really, after what you just saw in the text, is it satisfactory to sum up all of grace to say God's unmerited favor? Does that teach you anything about holiness and godly living? Is there any exhortation in that? For the grace of God that leads to salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, and grace is the power to do it. So we have to reject the common concept that's, that's so abundantly blanketed over all of evangelicalism that grace is God's unmerited favor. No, if, if that's all it is, then, then it doesn't have one scrap of evidence towards that direction in any one of those verses that we read. It's so much more than that. It's the divine power working through us, the enablement to righteous living, the strength of God that works, it literally works in the believer, the God-given ability to perform spiritual tasks, and the empowerment to holiness. Why? Because the power source that you live from is the exact same source of power that Christ lived from. It's the exact same spirit that, 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 that rose Christ from the dead. The power being the Holy Spirit. He's the source. Romans 8, 11. But if the spirit who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. And so it's God, grace is God giving you strength and power to live life his way. But it happens with your participation. It doesn't happen absent of your participation, like, like something that's like fast food that's delivered through a drive through window, done and, done and delivered to you through your window, and then you have it and you can drive away. No, no, no. It's more like you, you go into the kitchen and you make it with God. 2 Peter 1.10, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election certain, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. This is the application of grace. Peter isn't saying work for your salvation. He's saying work out your salvation. He's saying, he's saying access that grace by which we stand and stand. Make your call and election certain. You only receive grace when you partner with God and stay in relationship with God. In each one of those instances that we read, it's, it's the believer, Paul, engaging with God to do a work. It's not God doing the work for him and then giving Paul the credit. No, that's not, that's not grace whatsoever. Absolutely not. It's Paul using the power of God to do the work of God, to godly living, godly, godly holy, you know, living in holiness, godly works, his, 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 his calling, spiritual works you only receive grace when you partner with god when you stay in relationship with him when you do not wickedly depart from god into sin but when you diligently seek the lord every day but god has no use for the wicked lazy servant that buried his talent in the ground the lord rewards those who diligently seek him he proverbs 31 23 he plentifully rewards the proud doer and psalm 68 12 but God will wound the head of his enemies, the hairy scalp of the one who still goes on in his trespasses. So as we participate, then we grow in grace. And knowledge, the knowledge of God comes with that. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As we participate with God, we learn how to access grace. We learn how to, how to use it to overcome sin. To get to how, to, how to use it to walk in the faith in a way that's pleasing to God. 
2 Peter 3.18, but grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Then as we grow in grace, we're made strong by grace. We're made strong and we're strengthened in the faith to walk uprightly before God. Paul identifies grace as the source of Christian strength. 2 Timothy 2.1, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. This is a, that one we read a minute ago. It's in the passive. It means be made strong, but, but Timothy's supposed to do it. So how's Timothy supposed to do it? He's supposed to access the grace. Do you see that in our verse? Through whom we also have access by faith into this grace. How do you be made strong in it? Who's the one who's supposed to do it? Timothy is. How? By accessing grace. And in doing so, you will become strong. You will be made strong. Other uses that we see of God's strength enabling the believer, which, is, which happens by grace, is Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. How does Christ strengthen you? Through grace. How else? There's no other mechanism for that. 1 Timothy 1.12, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me, for he has counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. How has, he been, how has Christ enabled Paul? Well, through grace. He, Paul accessed grace. 2 Timothy 4.17, Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. How did that happen? By grace. Strength comes by grace. We saw that earlier. That by me, the preaching might be fully known and all the Gentiles might, might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. So God's strength enabled Paul to get through times of prosperity and times through poverty. That's what it is. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. He's saying that there have been times I've had nothing. and There have been times I've had plenty. I can do, I can do all of it through God's grace. Paul, grace enabled Paul to be put into the ministry. It strengthened him, enabled him. It strengthened Paul to fully preach the gospel. Even though his life was given to the lion, he was rescued from the mouth of the lion. Those strengths, those empowerments were given by grace. Paul participating with God to do the work that God called him to do. Just as, and just as salvation is a gift of grace, by grace you've been saved through faith, and not of yourselves it is a gift of God, Ephesians 2. So the empowerment to live the Christian life is a gift of grace also. Can you live the Christian life on your own? Absolutely not. But by grace you can. By grace you can live up to every single thing that's written in the whole scripture in obedience to God. Just as you were born into the faith by grace, God gives you grace to enable you to live his ways. You cannot earn it. You do not deserve it, but it's freely given to whoever approaches the throne of grace to find help in time of need. Those who are saved are saved from the power and practice of sins, and so that, and so that in, our, and, and so in that our sins are taken away, we'll one day be saved from the penalty of our sins. That's the future tense of salvation. But you and I wouldn't be saved from anything if we continued to live out your same pre-conversion sins throughout the time of your supposedly converted lives, you might be forgiven for a day and then go back to your sins like a dog to their vomit only to be condemned again. No, without, without holiness, without God's empowerment to live a holy life, which starts out by the thing that he does, which is to sanctify you. And the sanctified person has access to grace. And so he can live in holiness without which no man will see the Lord the Lord. So there's something more than just forgiveness is needed. Something must happen to enable you to live the life that's fully pleasing to God. If, if, if the whole of the message of Christianity was to have your sins forgiven, then okay, you can have your sins forgiven today, and then tomorrow you're going to be back in the exact same rut, living the same life, doing the same filthy things, having the same condemnation. No, there's something better than that. There's something more than that to the Christian life. And that's to be, and that's the, you're, you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified, all at the same time, and the sanctification gives you access to grace. To, you're set apart to live a holy life, and now grace is available to, so you can do that. Access, you know what access implies? It implies you go get it. That's what access implies. That's the reason why Romans 5.2 says the word access. It doesn't say, by whom we have this grace. You notice it doesn't say that? It doesn't say, by whom we have this grace. It says, by whom we have access by faith into this grace. Access means it's up to you. 
Are you going to access? You ha- the door is open. Will you walk through it? There's a granary that's filled with grain, and you're hungry. You need grain. Will you access the doorway that's been freely opened for you to go and get the grain? Or will you stand outside and say, I'm hungry, and I can't, and I, and I can't get it for myself? So how will you access it, and where will you access it? How? Well, verse 2 tells you how. By faith. By faith. Access by faith into this grace in which you stand. All of the Christian life is by faith. How did you come into salvation? By faith. Is, is walking with Christ any different? No, it's not. It's the life of faith. And where do you access it? At, at God's throne. Not just his throne, but there's another scripture, Hebrews 4, 16. It says, therefore, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In Hebrews 4, 16, it doesn't say, let us come boldly to the throne or even to God's throne, but it designates the purpose for which we go there, to the throne of grace, so that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So where do we go to God's throne of grace? That's coming to God in prayer by faith. There's only one way to access God, and that's not by going to Jerusalem. It's not by going to Mecca or to a pilgrimage of the Catholic shrines. It's to access God through prayer. When you bow your head, you're believing that there is a God and that he can be accessed. And as you bow your head, it's as if you're ushered into God's presence because of Christ You're brought into the throne room of heaven in order to give your thanksgiving to God the Father and make your petitions known at the throne of grace. God has grace and you have need. And that's the perfect match. You're not supposed to be able to live life separate from him on your own. You and I are supposed to need him every minute, every hour of every day. If... if. Salvation were a gift that you could put in your pocket and walk away from God, then that is not the salvation of the Bible. God has grace you have need. But you can't get it by sending someone else. Personal interaction between you and the Father is the only way to get what you need, to get your daily bread. God's word promises that there's grace available. I'm I'm coming to the Lord through faith in order to get the grace that I need to help me live God's will today, the grace to help in time of need. This is my time of need today. I need his help today. And so access is made by prayer. Some of these other things, that these other prayers, lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. Or Jesus told Peter, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. Jesus was telling Peter, you need grace to make it through tonight. Go and access it. Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. If Peter had obeyed Jesus' request, he would not have fallen into temptation. He didn't watch and pray, though. Jesus later said, could you not watch and pray with me for one hour? And Peter fell. He stumbled. But everyone who comes to the throne of grace will find grace given to them. Everyone who petitions God for the empowerment to live his way will find it. Will find that as they walk out their day that they have been given that empowerment. It doesn't do the master any good to have a servant that's unable to perform his tasks. To send a servant out to go and do work and not tell him what work is to be done is to be hurtful to himself. It's to It's the master cutting off his own feet or to not make him able to do the task, to give him all the skills, all the training, all the tasks, all all of the, all the, the energy needed, all of the instruction needed, all the empowerment needed to go and do the task. That's in the master's benefit. And that's exactly what God does. Everyone who petitions God for the empowerment to live his way will find that they have that empowerment. It doesn't come as a feeling. It doesn't come as an ecstatic jolt of energy. No, it feels like nothing. But the power quietly works in your spirit, empowering you to subdue the flesh, to put to death the flesh, to render the flesh inoperable, Romans 6, 6. And how? By believing and trusting that God has the strength available for you to overcome every single trial and every single temptation of every single day. 
This is the life of faith. Hebrews 12, 12. This is what it is to strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. To go to the throne room of grace, the throne of grace, and to get that which you need today to be strong, to live God's way. If you haven't read it, read this book, All of Grace by Spurgeon. It is so refreshing, and it brings such light, and you can access it by free on the internet because it's so old. It, It brings such light into a day when grace is so manipulated and perverted. Dear friends, salvation would be a sadly incomplete affair if it had if it did not deal with this part of our ruined estate. We want to be purified as well as pardoned. Justification without sanctification would not be salvation at all. It would call the leper clean but leave him to die of his disease. It would forgive the rebellion and allow the rebel to remain an enemy to his king. It would remove the consequences but overlook the cause. And this would leave an endless and hopeless task before us. It would stop the stream for a time, but leave an open fountain of defilement, which would sooner or later break forth with increased power. Remember that the Lord Jesus came to take away sin in three ways. He came to remove the penalty of sin, the power of sin, and the presence of sin. At once you may reach the second part, the power of sin may immediately be broken, and so you will be on the road to the third, the removal of the presence of sin. We know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And so having been made strong, we stand. Romans 5, 2, through whom we also have access by faith into this grace by which we stand. A stand is to persist. It's to continue. It's to persevere in the faith. Without grace, any one of us, every one of us would fall. We'd fall often. We'd fall hard. But with grace, with the true grace of God, you stand. Do you see that? You you have to see that in the verse. This grace by which we stand. It doesn't say this grace by which we fall. Because true grace makes you to stand. Jude 124. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to keep you from stumbling. He's, God's able to do that. He has that ability, that strength, that he'll freely give to anybody who wants it. Ephesians 3.20, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundant above all that we ask or think, according to, according to what? And usually when that verse is quoted, there's a period put right there. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, period. But it doesn't end there. According to the power that works in us. Ephesians 3.20, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Romans 14.4, Who are you to judge another's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. If you're a servant of God, you, then, and, then you access his throne room of grace to get the grace you need to help in time of need each day to live God's way. And if you do that, you will be made to stand. God is able to make you to stand. Someone will say, you mean there's something expected of me? Blasphemy, that's a works-based salvation. No, foolish man, this is a scriptural-based salvation. This in its entirety is all of Christ. By all, by Christ is of Christ and for Christ and by Christ. Christ is the start, Christ is the end, Christ is the middle, he's the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, but he's also everything in between. He's every make waking moment to live is Christ. Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is what it's supposed to look like. Christians were called Christians because they all acted like Jesus. They were like little Christs everywhere. 
It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. <clears throat> this is the grace-filled life that you were spiritually born again in order to live. It's not a freedom to live as you please without consequences. That's the false grace that's preached today. The true grace is the empowerment to live free from sin in order to live a life of holiness that's required by God, to stand. Titus 2, 11 through 13, we, we read part of this, but there's a little bit more. For the true grace of God, or for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. That's what grace is. Friend, if you don't find this version of grace, this true version of grace, and strengthen yourself in it, be made strong in it by accessing the throne of grace so that you can stand solid and firm in the faith, not falling again into sin, if you, if you never find this version of grace, then you will not stand at God's judgment seat. Psalm 1.5, Therefore the ungodly shall not stand at the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. What does that mean? Instead, instead of standing upright as somebody, as, as a proud doer of the work, you'll be cast down. You'll be thrown down as a worthless sinner who's proven yourself to be unworthy of eternal life, but worthy of the torments of punishments of hell that will follow. Because this is the only grace that, that causes someone to stand. The only way by which anybody can stand in the faith is by the way God has ordained, which is the true version of grace. But if you do find this true grace and you strengthen yourself in it, then you will stand. You will stand firm in the faith now, overcoming all temptation and sin, and you will stand at the judgment seat as a proud doer of the work, being commended for accessing grace to overcome sin. 1 Peter 5.12, By Silvanus, a faithful brother unto you, as I suppose I have written briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein you stand. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 1.24, Not that we have dominion over your faith, but are fellow workers of your joy, for by faith you stand. Your intended, God's intent for you is to stand. The true grace of God wherein you stand, by faith you stand. 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand. And so when we, when we couple that with another truth of God's, of God's word, then we understand how this whole thing is supposed to work together. Here's the other truth, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with the temptation will also make the way of escape so that you may be able to, to bear it or to, um, to uphold yourself through it to the end without falling. And it's the strength to take, so grace is the strength, it, it includes the strength to take the way of escape from sin when it's offered, when you're tempted. Temptations are going to come. And if you don't have the strength to take the, the way of escape, then you will fall into them again. So this truth, coupled with the true grace of God by which we stand, results in the life that overcomes all sin, the life that's fully pleasing to God. I think it's Ephesians 1. To live fully pleasing to him. Not mostly pleasing except for those few bad moments. No, no, but fully pleasing to him. How so? It's like this. <clears throat> Let's imagine that you're a math test, you're, you're a math teacher, and you're giving some students a math test. Now you have a PhD in mathematics, and the student is taking algebra two. And so there could be some difficult questions with algebra two, and you're proctoring the test. The only questions that are on the test are the ones that you have personally, personally scrubbed. And so you made sure that all the questions on the test are only at the Algebra 2 level. That's it. There's no other questions beyond that. So, and the student has taken Algebra 2. So even though there's some difficult things, you have verified that the only questions that the student will see are questions that they have the full ability to answer. There's, no, there's going to be no question on that test that's beyond their ability to answer. And just to make sure, because it's your, in your intent that they do well, just to make sure that they have all the help they need, you, you, you tell them this, I'll be sitting right over here right over there. 
If you have any uncertainty, any questions about how a problem is to be handled, come and ask me. I'll guide you through the problem every step of the way. I can't take the test for you, but this is just as good as me taking the test for you, and it's allowed for this test. And in fact, nobody can pass this test unless they come and ask me some questions, unless, unless they come and get my help. I have all the help you could ever need, and I'll be sitting right over there. All you have to do, whenever there's any doubt, whenever there might be the possibility of failing and, and to answer a question correctly, just come over and talk to me. I'll work the problem with you step by step. And one hour later, and you, so the student goes to, their, goes to their desk and they sit down and they work on the, on, on the Algebra 2 test and one hour later they come back. They never asked for help, but they come back and they give you the test. So you take a look and, and your, your, your red pen goes to work. Wrong, wrong, wrong. A couple of review questions from Algebra 1. Okay, they got those correct, the easy ones, but the rest of the test is a failure. Questions on matrices, wrong. This other question on matrices, wrong. Next question on matrices, wrong. There's a common failure pattern through all that they're doing. Just like there's a common sin pattern in people's lives of iniquity. So what went wrong? You've removed every impediment. There's no reason that the student should get any grade except for a 100%. The only reason that a student would get a lesser grade is related to willingness. Level of difficulty has been pre-screened in order to ensure success. Ability has been supplemented in, supplemented in order to ensure success. The only thing the student has to bring to the table is their willingness and they didn't bring their willingness. So do you excuse them for their failing grade? No, there, there is no excuse. You told them clearly all the help you could ever possibly need, I have. All you have to do is come and ask me, and I will help you through every single step of every single problem if that's what it takes. But they failed to do that. Can you pass them? No. There's no excuse for a failing grade. Absolutely no excuse. And this is why a believer who sins has, a believer's life who sins has no excuse either. The level of difficulty of problems that, that, that will ever enter your life has been pre-screened. God will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape so that you may be able to endure it. For the believer, there will never be a trial or temptation that's beyond your ability in Christ ever, ever, ever. Christ's own, God's own word promises this very thing. Ability has been supplemented. For those times when there might be some difficulty, God has given access to his throne of grace better than a PhD in the pocket during a math test. God has the grace to overcome in time of need. So the only thing left to chance is your willingness. Willingness to overcome sin is the only thing you can bring to the table, but it's the one thing that you must bring to the table or you will never find salvation. You might have your sins forgiven, and then you'll go back to them again and again. If you do not overcome, it is only because you love the sin. In fact, it's proof that you love that sin more, that you love, more than you love Christ. John 15, if you love me, obey my commands. Grace doesn't force you to come. It's only accessible to those that want it. But for those who don't want it, the results will be a life lived in sin for which there is condemnation. Titus 2.11 again, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. For the willing person who comes to the throne of grace to find help, to find mercy, and, find, and, and get grace to help in time of need, they will be made to stand. They will be made to overcome. Jude 124, now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Did you catch that? Him who is able to keep you from falling, keep you even from stumbling. 
but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 2.18. Often when grace is mentioned in the New Testament, it implies God's abilities conveyed to the believer. It's just implied. When you, when you see grace, look for how, and if that word were to mean the supply of God's ability, God's strength, and then reread the verse and see how it, it improves your understanding of it. For example, 1 Peter 5.10. <clears throat> Even when you have to suffer, then God's grace will perfect and establish and strengthen you. So 1 Peter 5.10. But the God of all grace, why does it mention grace in that verse? The God of all grace. Because there's a provision of strength that's about to be mentioned. 1 Peter 5.10. But the God of all grace who has called us to eternal glory by Christ Jesus after you have suffered a while, and here's where the grace comes, will we'll make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Even though you have to go through suffering, the grace of God will come along, the strength of God, the enablement that he gives to live his way will be backfilled. It'll come to you. It's, it's, it's necessary to see these uses of grace in scriptures because we're living in a day when the grace of God has been turned into lasciviousness. And that happened way back in Peter's day, but it's happening more today than ever before from what I think. Jude 1.14, or 1, four, For there are certain men crept in, who crept in unawares, or secretly, stealthily, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. They're denying the lordship of Christ. They're rejecting Christ's teachings as their commands. They're rejecting Christ from being their Lord. He can be their Savior, but not their Lord. They refuse to obey him. They're ungodly men, and they turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. What does that mean? Lasciviousness. It's the word aselgia. It appears to be a compound word form from the word um, zelge, which was the name of a city in, in Pisidia whose citizens excelled in the strictness of morals. So there was a city in Pisidia called zelge, and they exceeded in strictness and morals. And so people knew that's, that's, um, that's godly. Like they're, they're, they're living in a way that has very high morals, very high, you know, uh, excelling in morals. And so it's the name of that city plus the negative particle alpha at the beginning. Aselgia. It means the opposite of that. It means do anything you want. It's the opposite of strict morals. It, the Strong's gives the definition of unbridled lust, excess, licentiousness, wantonness, which is like a, 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 a desire for uh, things that should not be had. Out, outrageousness, shamelessness, and insolence. And so 150 years ago in Spurgeon's day was common biblical knowledge that grace was given to enable obedience to the life of a believer for holiness and righteous living. That was just well known. And there were, there, there were some people back then, just as in Peter's day, who were turning the grace of God into, into lasciviousness. They were surely there also. But it was not an uncommon knowledge that the grace of God was to live a holy life. But today... Grace has been so perverted and taught that it's a means that there's no need for a life of holiness and, and righteous living. It's been turned into the very opposite of what, it's, of what it truly is. Instead of grace of the grace of God that leads, that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. The, the modern version of grace says, God is so good that there's no need for, uh, um, for there's no need to deny ungodliness or worldly lust. There's no need to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world because Jesus paid it all. It's not that you, it's not that they tell you that you're allowed to sin. No, of course not. They'd be, they'd be found out much too quickly if they just said that flat out. They do it much more subtly. They just simply defend the activity of sins. Nobody can stop sinning, they say. And as long as, the presence, as long as the presence of sin is acceptable, as long as it's accepted, then any and all sin is accepted. 
At that point, there's nothing that, that in, in the doctrine that could stop you from having a homosexual pastor. There's nothing to disqualify a pastor because everybody's going to sin. Or they'll say, we're all hypocrites. Come and join. There's always room for one more hypocrite. I heard a, a well-known preacher use that, and it just disgusted me. You, more than anyone else, probably in this nation, should understand what Jesus said about hypocrisy. Not realizing that hypocrisy is exactly what Jesus warned against. If your church is full of hypocrites, then you are unleavened bread, and you need to start kicking some people out. Hypocrisy is exactly what Jesus warned against. Beware the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. And so the modern version is redefined grace in order to allow sin. And then in, in this verse right here in verse 5, they because they redefine grace, they have to redefine stand also in order to keep themselves in the face while they sin. And so for them, their grace is their ticket to avoid punishment for their sin actions, their ticket to sin for free. That's what, it, that's what licentious living means, to sin for free. But Christ didn't die and rise again in order to make you a hypocrite or to, or to, or to let you fall. He died and rose again to make you of righteous character and actions and able to stand. And that's captured in this verse of ours, the grace of God by which we stand. It doesn't say the grace of God by which we fall. And so what's the different definition that they use for stand? They say, even though I fall into sin, I'm still seated in heavenly places, standing in the faith. Modern teaching would say that God, th th this means that God makes you to stand spiritually even though you fall into sin. And this is captured in a worship song. When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Isn't that a contradiction in terms? When I can't stand, then I'll fall, but I'll fall on you. What, it sounds to me like what the real intention is. When I cannot stand, I'll fall into sin, and that's okay because then I'll go to Jesus and he'll forgive me of my sins again. Or... When I fall, really, I'm still standing. Maybe that's what they mean. When I fall into sin, I'm really still standing. And I ask, do people believe that? Worthless garbage doctrine? Well, yeah, they sure do. By the tens of millions. The, go, go look up the album. You'll find it sold a lot. The false version of grace is today's favorite doctrine. There's, but there's nothing noble or glorious or godly about falling. Anywhere you look in the Bible, to fall is never, ever a good thing. But to stand, and to stand even though you fall, that's not even a biblical position. It's a theory that only, makes, that only works in the world of make-believe in the land of fixie, pixie dust and fairies. They've perverted grace in order to continue in sin, and then they pervert the, the, the plain meaning of stand in order to allow them to continue their perversion of grace so they could continue to sin. But people today love enchantments, even if it makes no sense. And the, and the more outlandish, the better. The more, the more that they can pile grace on top of grace to be shown to be radical, the more scandalous they can make it, the better people will buy it. And the last 70 years seems to be a resurgence of all things grace. Look at the names of churches. Half of them have the word grace in their title. Look at the titles of Christian books. Probably a third of them have the grace in their title. Look at sermon titles. Compare how many say, say the word holiness or purity versus how many uh, have the word grace in it. You, and now do you understand why we don't talk about this a whole lot here? Because it's so misrepresented and perverted. The people will just think we're talking about the same version. Nope. And this resurgence of grace would be a, would be a great thing if it was about true grace. But it hasn't been about true grace. It's, a, it's been a resurgence of false grace. Give yourself some grace. That means let yourself not be perfect. Give yourself allowance for sin. Don't be so hard on yourself. The problem is the person who understands that doesn't understand what grace is. They think that it's allowance or license to sin or to be deficient in some, in, in, in some manner, to do less than your best, a license for inadequacy or for sin. That's, that's, the, that's the only way that that, that that phrase can be used. Give yourself some grace. It means lower your standards. Do you, do you see what grace has done to your thinking? 
what the false version of grace has done to your thinking. Lower your standards. Give yourself some grace. That's the perversion that's been that's been taught, that's been that's blanketed evangelical Christianity today. So the, so the problem with, even with that phrase is first of all it's that phrase proves that there's a perversion of grace in the person's mind. They don't understand what grace is. Because if they were to say that with the right understanding of grace, that would mean the exact opposite thing. Give yourself some grace would mean go to the throne room of grace and get help to live the godly life. It means step up your game, not tone it down. Then the second problem is you don't have a throne of grace from which to dispense grace. Give yourself some grace? Well, where are you going to get it from? Where's, are you the originator of grace? Do you have storehouses of grace built up? The ability to help in time of need? Oh, you don't? Then how is it that you could give yourself anything that's related to grace? You have no grace. And to fall has everywhere in Scripture has a negative connotation. When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Oh, you better not fall. Satan fell. Judas fell by transgression. A third of the angels in heaven fell. Only evil things fall in the Bible. So when you sing, I cannot, when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you, that's conditioning you to be okay with falling. Oh, it's insidious, isn't it? Look how, see how, see how they got you there? Don't sing that song. Sin is always a fall, a moral fall and a spiritual fall. And when you fall into sin, you're no longer spiritually standing. You have fallen. You are spiritually condemned, which is promised by Romans 8.1 implied. And the wages of sin is death, which is promised by, Gal- by Romans 6.23. Our Spurgeon quote from... <clears throat> It cannot be that pardon of sin should be given to an impenitent sinner. This, this, is, this would be to confirm him in his evil ways and to teach him to think little of evil. If the Lord were to say, you love sin and you live in it, and you're going on from bad to worse, but all the same, I forgive you. This would be the same as proclaiming a horrible license for iniquity, which is exactly what we find today. The foundations of social order would be removed and moral anarchy would follow. I cannot tell what innumerable mischiefs would certainly occur if you could divide repentance and forgiveness and pass by the sin while the sinner remained as fond of it as ever. In the very nature of things, if we believe in the holiness of God, it must be so that if we continue in our sin and will not repent of it, that we cannot be forgiven. and We must reap the consequences of our inobstinacy or hard our, our, our hard neck, our refusal to obey God's words. According to the infinite goodness of God, we are promised that if we forsake our sins, confessing them, and will by faith accept the grace which is provided in Christ Jesus, that God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But so long as God lives, there can be no promise of mercy to those who continue in their evil ways and refuse to acknowledge their wrongdoing. Surely no rebel can expect the king to pardon his treason while he remains in open revolt. No one can be so foolish as to imagine that the judge of all the earth will put away our sins if we refuse to put them away ourselves. But today, most professing believers want their pretend faith. They want their false version of grace so they could have a relationship with the Frankenstein cut-and-paste version of the God of the Bible, a false representation of him, one that's made to their liking, one who's who's made after our own image and after our own likeness, one that is okay with the moderate amount of sin in your life. They want a God they can control, a God who isn't harsh, but only described by the word love. Like a wind-up doll, he only says the things that are pre-programmed into him. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. And most professing believers prefer this for their God, this false God, rather than the true God of the Bible. Because the true God of the Bible is scary, he's uncontrollable, and he's hard to understand. Knowing the perverted version of grace was already happening, Peter felt it necessary to describe the true grace of God. 1 Peter 13, 14. 
as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance, but as he who has called you also, uh, who, <clears throat> here's a couple verses from First Peter that are the lead into what Peter calls the true grace of God. Okay, First Peter 1, 13 and 14. Um, <clears throat> and be as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, so you also be holy in all your conduct. And in First Peter two eleven, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. First Peter four one, cease from sin. And among other commands, those are some of the more the more direct ones. Peter affirms this as being the true grace of God and and the way in which we stand. First Peter five twelve, by Silvanus a faith. So at the end of these sayings that I just that I just read, which are an exhortation to holiness and purity. And the command to cease from sin, then Peter says, I have written briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein you stand. That's the true grace of God. The Holy Spirit prompted Peter to describe the true grace of God because there were those who were already in his day teaching lasciviousness, grace as a license to sin turning the grace of God into lasciviousness, and God had it, had it codified in the, te- in the Bible text for us so we could also understand what true grace is. The verses like these are so necessary in order to undo the programming that a person has gotten from the false teaching of grace as a license to sin. Jude 1.4 for there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not that they preach lasciviousness, it's just that holiness is not upheld. When they give allowance for sin, then that's saying holiness is not necessary. And if it's not necessary, then why would anybody pursue it? And if you don't uphold holiness, then the flesh will corrupt everything. Holiness doesn't happen by accident, but lasciviousness lasciviousness does happen by accident. It absolutely happens by accident. You only have to open the gate and the whole herd will run out the gate. That's what lasciviousness is. The true grace of God keeps the gate up. The false grace of God opens the gate. And then all the sins that are in the heart run out in full fury to do all all the wickedness that they've ever wanted to do. And it's called grace. And this results in people who say, everybody sins, nobody can stop. Those people have a form of godliness, but they deny the power to live in a godly way. Because godly living is not for an hour while you're at church or a day on Sunday, but it's for the whole week and week the next week and the week after that and the week after that. Do you know how often Jacob, I'm sorry, Joseph was was attempted to be seduced by Potiphar's wife, it happened over and over and over again. And Joseph kept refusing and kept turning away and kept getting himself to safety. It's just the very last one that was the crescendo. But it said, it, 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 the Bible says that, that she pressed on him sore. She kept doing it. It does no good to, to say no one time and then to give in the next time. Nope, that's just as good as giving in the first time. That's having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. That's people who think that it's think that as long as they look good on Sunday, for Sunday church, maybe the whole day Sunday, whatever, and then they could squirrel away their hour during the week sometime to do things that they know they shouldn't. That's 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 a hypocrite. That's somebody that will be cast out. That's not a godly person, that's not a righteous person. Hebrews ten, twenty eight, twenty nine, would you turn there please? This is an important one to see, Hebrews 10, 28, 29. <clears throat> and so the false version of grace that's preached so predominantly today opens the gate and allows lasciviousness. <clears throat> it allows people who seem to have come to some sort of knowledge of God to sin willfully. It doesn't hinder them. It doesn't stop them. 
Hebrews 10.26 shows what happens to those people who are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Nobody told them they were supposed to live in holiness. They just told them, grace, grace. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, a common thing, to be a common thing, and insulted the spirit of grace. Do you see why the word grace is in there now? For we know because it's that's the spirit that would have provided the ability to live the righteous lifestyle, to avoid sin. And we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. Do you see that in verse 30? We know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So in verse 29, to do, to open the gate by means of today's version of grace, that false grace, and to let people go out and sin willingly is to condemn them to death. It's to condemn them to eternal death, to a, a situation in life where there is no forgiveness. There's no sacrifice that can be given for those sins. That insults the spirit of grace. Why does it say spirit of grace? Because the spirit of grace is the one who has the power that was needed to avoid sin. So it's an insult to him that you didn't go to him to get the grace needed in time of need. You insulted him by not going to get the help that was available right there. You insulted the math teacher by not going and asking for help on all those questions that you knew that you didn't have an answer for and you left blank. That's an insult. They were there, able to help, willing to help, wanting to help, and you just never came and asked for it. That's an insult to them. And to overcome, to overcome sin is what would have happened if the person had come to the throne of grace, but instead they willfully sin. That's to insult the spirit of grace that would have been, enabled them to overcome that sin. And in verse 30, we know him. You know who? Him who said these three things, vengeance is mine and I will repay and the Lord will judge his people. Do you know him? Do you have an entrance into the grace of God? Have you been granted an audience with the king of glory? And when you know him, the one who will judge his people, not even talking about the world, but who will repay sin, who will do so with vengeance? And will you go out and sin willfully now? Do not be high-minded, but fear. For if God didn't spare the natural branches due to their unbelief and disobedience, he will not spare you either. You stand by faith. Have you, have you not read that, that the branches were gathered up and cast into the fire? The branches that did not abide in Christ? Because if you know him, then you surely must know the reward for disobedience. So to sin willfully is to have grace available to strengthen you, but to refuse it. To have a way of escape offered to you, but to ignore it. To know what God's commands are and to deny them. To have forgiveness and to abuse it by going back to sin. To have the strength of God available, but to reject it and to deny it with a hardened neck to go on your own way, to sin willfully is to insult the spirit of grace. It's to say with your actions, thanks for the forgiveness, but I like my, old, my own way. Thanks, but no thanks. But my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Nobody told them that they must live apart from sin. Nobody told them that they could live free from sin. Nobody told them that God expects holiness and life and conduct. And even though they've read that verse, Pursue peace with all men in holiness without which no man will see the Lord. It didn't click. God expects 
a holy life 24 7 every day week in week out there's no downtime that you get to give yourself some grace it's not in the bible except for with judas iscariot so how could you possibly escape if you neglect so great a salvation how could we possibly escape if we neglect so great a salvation can a man take fire into his, into his bosom and not be, burn, be burned? Ask David as he held his dying son. Ask David as he fled from Absalom. Can a woman be unchaste and it remain hidden? Ask the woman whose sin is now spoken of throughout the whole known world, whose testimony is in the Bible for 2,000 years. And will God deal with you with kid gloves? Knowing him and insulting the spirit of grace by denying the grace that he has available to help in time of need, and so you could do your own lust and passion? Will God, will God forgive that? Will God deal with you with kid gloves? You who take his commands and trample them underfoot, don't you know that in doing so, you're remaking yourself into an enemy of God in James? Whoever makes himself a friend of the world, and that's specifically with sexual immorality, whoever makes himself a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And if this, what we're talking about today, is true, and you have seen it in the scripture for your own, with your own eyes, then how many people will be duped into a false religion, into a false religion of Baal and Ashtaroth, repackaged as modern-day evangelicalism? How many people are going to burn in hell for intentionally sinning against God? Millions. Tens of millions. And Jesus said, many will come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord, open to us. We did this and we did that. And he'll say, depart from me. You are a worker of iniquity. Oh, you did pretty good for the whole week long except for one hour. And that makes you a worker of iniquity. Oh, you did pretty good for the whole week long except for your two or three 30-minute Give yourself some grace moments, and that makes you a worker of lawlessness, and you will be cast out for that. Second Peter three one, according to his divine power, as, according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that called us to glory and virtue. There is nothing, there is nothing you could ever need to be godly in life that's not already freely given to you and me in Christ Jesus. So to have a means of standing. And to fall instead? To sin willfully after you know him? Friend, you don't have any idea who you're dealing with. You are tempting fate. You are cutting the, your own cord, your own thread, by which you're held over the pits of hell. You're, you're reaching up with scissors or a knife and cutting it yourself. You may have been introduced to him, but others have corrupted your understanding of him. And if you don't have your understanding of him improved, then you will find yourself wailing and bemoaning your life at the end of your shortened days. Oh, how I hate instruction, because you certainly do not know who you are dealing with. Grace is able to make you stand unless you refuse to stand. It's too difficult to, you, you may, oh, it's too difficult to access grace. It's too inconvenient to make changes to my preferences. So to not stand indicates an unwillingness on your part, intentional rebellion, or spiritual laziness. Or if you teach other, for the person who teaches others this, that's sedition. That's teaching anarchy within the ranks. And with such an abundance of grace, this comes with responsibility, obviously. Because of the great grace that's given by which to stand, there are consequences for not standing. So to stand is in contrast to fall, to fall away from the faith. Romans 14, 4. Who are you that judges another man's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Those are the only two things that could be, that could be happening. And the one who serves God, he will be holding up, for God is able to make him stand. But to fall away is to give in to the temptation of sin through inward desires or outward circumstances. Luke 8, 13, but the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root, which who believe for a while, and in time of temptation, they fall away. Someone says, but my sin must be okay, because I'm still here. I haven't fallen away yet. 
friend, you didn't hear the passage. Those, those are the ones on, on the rock who believe for a while. And in time of temptation, they fall away. It doesn't say the first time of temptation or even the second time of temptation. Just a time of temptation, they fall away. Are you a professing believer who's still living in sin? Then right now is your a while who believe for a while. You're still untested metal. Until you come through the testing successfully, you will not receive the crown of life. And if the righteous judgment of the Lord is that you've exhausted your chances, when your amount of time for your a while is finished, when he's finally had enough patience, his patience is wearing thinner and thinner, then you will fall away. It just hasn't happened yet. He's been merciful until now, but every day that you presume upon his mercy, his patience wears thinner and thinner. Judas Iscariot's covetousness drove him to fall into the temptation to sell Christ, and he got 30 pieces of silver out of it, but that wasn't his first temptation. His first temptation was when Jesus first gave him the money bag. And he would take what was put in it and, and keep it for himself. Selling Christ was only the final act by which Judas fell by transgression. God had patience for Israel, long patience. But then one day it ended and he sent the Assyrian army against Israel. And when the Assyrian army arrived, then it was too late to avert God's judgment. He had long patience for Judah. And then when his patience wore thin enough, then he sent the Babylonian army as his sword against Judah. And when that army arrived, it was too late to avert God's judge, judgment. It, God didn't judge Sodom's sin after the first time it was done, or even after the 17th time. But those who participated were blinded because of their own sin, and judgment came when they didn't expect it. The, the, the church at Thyatira, the false prophetess Jezebel, wasn't judged for her sin the first time. No, she was given time to repent, but she didn't repent, so judgment came. Revelation 2, 22, Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, and this they repent of their deeds. 1, Corinthians, 1 Kings 10, 11, 4, it came to pass when Solomon was Solomon when, when it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. God didn't send judgment on Solomon after Solomon built the first temple for the foreign god Baal, and not even after he built temples to the foreign god of Ashtaroth. And not even after until not until after he built a high place for Chemosh and another high place for Molech and another one for Milcom, all all false gods. And not even until after Solomon worshipped these false gods in the temples that he built for them. Not even through all of that did judgment come, but there was a day. First Kings eleven nine, and and the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned away from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared to him twice. And said, I will surely rend the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. So God raised up adversaries to Solomon and in order to turn him back to the Lord, but that didn't work either. Then the Lord sent the prophet Ahijah to Jeroboam and said, take ten tribes for yourself. Solomon believed for a while. For most of his life he believed. But his sin caught up with him in the end. And angels who left their first estate lest you would be tempted to leave this estate that you've been granted by such a glorious pardon that so few have ever had the opportunity for? Considering the percentage of people that have come to, come to true faith in Christ Jesus, you've been granted a place at the table of the King of Heaven, just like the angels had a place in his presence, and those who left their first estate, he has reserved in everlasting chains unto the fire of that great day. God's mercy upon you thus far is evidence of, not of him being okay with your sin, it's evidence of his long suffering, even though he's been burdened by your continuance in sins. And if God's goodness won't get through to you, then his judgment certainly will. Every transgression and disobedience received a just reward in Hebrews 12.2. And that was only for the words spoken by angels. So how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken not by angels, but by the Lord himself? And it was confirmed by those that heard him. And God also, the Father, bore witness with signs and wonders and gifts of the Holy Spirit. The whole Trinity was involved in giving us the word of God. 
And if a word that's simply delivered by angels, everyone receives a just, every transgression receives a dis, of disobedience receives a just reward, then how will you or I, how will we neglect, escape if we neglect so great a salvation that wasn't delivered just by mere angels, but by the Trinity of the Godhead himself? Spurgeon. <clears throat> Alas, cries another, my lack of strength lies in this direction and I cannot quit my sin. And I know that I cannot go to heaven and carry my sin with me. Well, says Spurgeon, I'm glad that you know that for it is quite true. You must be divorced from your sin or you cannot be married to Christ. Remember the question which flashed into, your, into the mind of young Bunyan when, his, when, when he was at his sports on the green on Sunday? Will you have your sins and go to hell or will you quit your sins and go to heaven? That brought him to a dead stand. That is a question which every man will have to answer, for there is no going on in sin and going to heaven. That cannot be. You must quit sin or quit hope. And I'll interject, there may be a time in between when you think that you can have both, but you cannot. You've deceived yourself. And in the end, you, you'll only have one master. It'll either be sin and self or it'll be Christ the Lord just because that hasn't been teased out to its very end quite yet, and you're still in that period of time of for a while, doesn't make it any less true. That is a question every man will have to answer, for there is no going on in sin and going to heaven. That cannot be. You must quit sin or quit hope. Do you reply, yes, I am willing enough to will is present with me, but how to perform that which which I want to do, I do not find. I don't find the power to quit. Sin masters me and I have no strength. Come then, if you have no strength, this text is still true. When we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Can you still believe that? However, other things may seem to contradict it. Will you believe it? God has said it and it is a fact. Therefore, hold on to it like grim death. For your only hope lies there. Be, believe this and trust Jesus and you shall soon find power with which to slay your sin. But apart from him, apart from Christ, the strong man armed will hold you forever as his bond slave. Personally, I could never have overcome my own sinfulness. I tried and failed. My evil propensities were too many for me till in the belief that Christ died for me, I cast my guilty soul on him. And then I received a conquering principle by which I overcame my sinful self. The doctrine of the cross can be used to slay sin even as the old warriors used their huge two-handled swords and mowed down their foes at every stroke. There is nothing like faith in the sinner's friend. It overcomes all evil. If Christ had died for me, ungodly as I am, without strength as I am, then I cannot live any, any longer in sin, but I must arouse myself to love and serve him who has redeemed me. I cannot trifle with the evil which slew my best friend, Christ. I must be holy for his sake. How can I live in sin which he has died to save me from it? And in the last day, if you do, if you do not stand now, then you will not stand in that day either. Revelation 6, 17, for the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? And if you are found in him, found by him in the way of righteousness and peace and faithfulness, then you will be, you'll, you'll be standing in that day when he comes, when he finds you, and you will stand in the judgment. Therefore, the, un, the ungodly will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. But if you are found by him in the way of sin and faithlessness, then you will cry to the rocks and to the hills, fall on us and cover us and hide us from the face of the Lamb and from his wrath. Luke 21, 36. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, 1 Corinthians 15, 1, which also you received and in which you stand. Hebrews 4, 11. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. Christ's grace is sufficient, more than able to cause us to stand and not to fall into sin. And our text for today, Romans 5, 2. <clears throat> 
Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace by which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Christ's grace is sufficient. It's more than sufficient to enable you to stand under every single testing, trial, or temptation that comes your way. The only thing you need to bring to the table is your willingness, your determination that you will live Christ's way, that you will go to the throne room of grace, the throne of grace, And if you do go, then you will find grace to help in time of need. Lead us not into temptation is how Christ taught us to pray this. Jude 124. Now to him who is, and and you will overcome all sin. Jude 124. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you or to stand you, that's what that word means. It's the same word, stand, histemi, and to stand you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. And everyone who has this hope in themselves will purify themselves even as Christ is pure. And everyone who doesn't have this hope in themselves will go back into sin. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Thank you for your loving kindness. Thank you that you have given an access to the throne of grace where we may find mercy and obtain grace to help in time of need. Thank you that you have promised that we will never see a trial or temptation that's too great for the strength that you give us. Thank you that you have done everything that you could possibly do except for take the test for us, the the trial of our faith that produces that which is more precious than gold that perishes, that produces results, the passing grade, which is more precious than gold that perishes. And you even do take the test for us as we abide in Christ, it's Christ in us is the hope of glory. That you've given us every single advantage to prove ourselves faithful to you. Lord, help us. Teach us how to access the throne of grace. Teach us its necessity. Teach us the requirement to turn away from sin, all sin. Anything that you make known, that's a requirement to turn away from it in itself. Heavenly Father, please don't let anyone here turn back to their sin or even find new paths of sin. Let each one here find forgiveness in Christ Jesus. And having found themselves justified and peace with you, then let them Let each one of us not only have access to the throne of grace, but to come to the throne of grace every as often as needed so that we could walk in the holiness that you require. We thank you and praise you in Christ's name, amen.